Okay, good morning, everybody. We're getting started on time. Okay, one minute to time. And I had to say that the this session, the first session of the uh, Student Academic Conference uh, Student Guider 2023 is open. And I give the floor to Mikhail Yulkin, General Director of Carbon Lab, who is our long-standing expert, a very enthusiastic person, uh, who once again is heading uh, this meeting. Michael, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. How are you? Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about climate change and the knowledge and skills that young people will probably need to have to be successful in this field and actually to do all other job. We are um, having in mind that climate is really changing and the world around is also changing. So we probably uh, try to touch some uh, points about that. Uh, I will be accompanied by my son this time, Grigory Yulkin, who works as a climate change and decarbonization manager for Lukoil. So we have a practical guy also uh, joining us, and he will probably share his expertise and his view on uh, what has to be done and what kind of knowledge and skills would be useful. Uh, and we also have uh, a lot of uh, um, requests for presentations from you guys. So I will probably start with giving floor to you. Uh, some of you send us a, a essay, some of you send us presentations. So we'll probably dedicate the first 20 to, to 30 minutes uh, to actually get through your presentations and then to probably build our further conversation on the outcomes of this presentation. So who is willing to start? Anybody willing to start? Hello. <laughs> Nobody. So I, I have a, like a list of presentations so in, in front of me. So maybe I would point uh, randomly. Uh, well, I can start. You can start. OK, cool, good. Please introduce yourself and then take it for. Uh, I am Daniel Futsai. I am a student at IBS. I am a year. I am the first year student, and I'm going to talk about uh, public-private partnerships and their contribution to fighting climate change. All right. So, but before you start, um, probably, uh, probably try to um, uh, do it in such a way that okay, we, you have like a two two kind of prominent guys in front of an expert and a very well-known manager of the company. So try to kind of be close to the point and try to impress us somehow. Okay, so we can actually learn something new from what you're talking about, okay? All right. Uh, I'll try to be straight to the point and uh, maybe you will uh, uh, no, learn something new from this presentation. Right. Okay because I spent a lot of time gathering materials for it. Uh, I am on a tablet, so I'm not sure if I can actually share the screen. Why? Why? Philip? Can you can you print it to, in, in, in the chat so we can probably show it for you? Uh, I will. Oh, I have the files, so I'll probably. Oh, I cannot open it for some reason. Cannot. Let's then wait for something. Somebody. Can you share it? Uh -huh. I mean, can you send it over? Uh, uh, in a few seconds. Hmm. Is it the one that says PPP in climate change? Uh, yes, it is. So perhaps it is all in our uh, telegram. Can you share greens in this case? I have sent the file in Zoom chat. Okay.
Okay, do you see it? Uh, yes. All right, so you go on and I will, and I will try to operate it, okay? okay? All right, thank you. So once again, my, the, my, the topic I have prepared for this conference is called Public-Private private Partnership and Climate Change. And I'm going to talk about, uh, first of all, just in case someone doesn't know what it is, uh, what is public-private partnership. Then I'm going to talk about its benefits for the public, how it can uh, um, help us mitigate the effects of climate change. And finally, uh, some statistics on how many projects there are and how much money has been invested into these projects. And uh, next slide, please. So yep. let's start. So let's start by giving a definition to public-private partnership, or a triple P for short. It's when public sector of uh, of economy, which is government and some uh, international organizations, collaborate with the private sector, their organizations, companies, and other legal entities to provide public services or assets. Why is it beneficial, you might ask? It's, uh, it's a great way to actually mobilize the resources and expertise to reach uh, for a great cause uh, because, uh, uh, because, the public, uh, uh, because the public actors can actually invest into projects uh, which will be rolled out by the companies. And uh, also, it's a great way to actually in to uh, to find more uh, private investors into this project because it uh, collaborates uh, because it helps to collaborate all participants of it. And finally, the society benefits from such uh, collaboration as well because it's uh, uh, it's quite a reliable way to improve infrastructure, for example, and uh, one of the goals we want to achieve is, of course, uh, to make public service, to improve public services and make them, in case we're talking about climate change, uh, more eco-friendly. More eco uh, so can, can you switch slide, please? Now let's talk. Uh, le now let's talk briefly about uh, how many years uh, were set for various projects. As you can see, most of these are from twenty to twenty-five years, but there are some projects which can be really short term, like the one which is supposed to take about around half a year, and. Uh, some of these can take up to 49 years, like that one project. Uh, some of these are uh, uh, devoted to, uh, most of these are devoted to uh, water supply and uh, purifying of water, but uh, others, for example, are uh, uh, direct, directed to proper waste disposal or even recycling of domestic waste. Uh, next slide, please. And here you can see uh, more in, and uh, uh, can you please switch the slide? I, uh, thank you. Uh, and here you can see how much money has been invested into these projects. And as you can see, the one of the most uh, uh, common problems is kind of overlooked, which is uh, reducing carbon emissions by uh, finding and uh, providing electricity using uh, renewable energy sources. Uh, only 11 billion rubles have been invested into such projects, while most of most of money went into waste, not even recycling, I'd say, but uh, into proper disposal of them. 
and actual recycling only takes up around 10% of this whole uh, fund of, of these funds. And uh, as you can see most, uh, me and as you can see only four green energy projects are being rolled out currently. And uh, only uh, 21 of these, of these projects are uh, actually to make our water clean, to make water cleaner. Uh, uh, and uh, this can mean only that, uh, this can, for example, mean that uh, uh, this uh, kind of problem needs to be solved, that we need to have more collaborations between the government and the organizations devoted to producing renewable energy supplies, because it will help us in our goal in mitigating the effects of climate change. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, all right, so. Um, do, do anybody have got questions? On the spot now to the to the to the presenter. Well, Grigori or somebody from the audience. No? Well, I thought the audience should should have the first uh, priority to uh, ask questions. Well, of course I do, but maybe uh, there are some students uh, courageous enough <laughs> to throw a question that we, which is quite obvious. Uh, where do you see the specific role of the partnerships that would raise the efficiency of the conclusions for the slide four? Mm -hmm. So basically what, what you have highlighted is the lack of efficiency in uh, these partnerships. Now you said it's public-private partnership. So where do you see the role of the government raising the efficiency of the conclusion made on slide four? Mm -hmm. Just your opinion. So for example, you would have a power to impact this uh, collision. What would you do in uh, if you were the shoes of our government or governmental authority? Uh, this is quite uh, an interesting in and uh, insightful question. And uh, I think that uh, I would uh, somehow maybe help help the private organizations make their minds into collaborating. For example, I could declare some material, declare a lot of material help, material support for the private investors who give their money to organizations who, for example, manufacture the, uh, the needs which are really required to produce the sources of, uh, uh, not produced, but to use the sources of renewable energy. Uh, or uh, I would uh, reduce taxes for those uh, companies who agree to participate in such, in such partnerships. All right. Have you actually investigated the history of um, uh, cooperation between the business and the government in the renewable energy sphere. It actually have been for quite some time, like 10 years already. And uh, still the share of renewable energy in the Russian energy mix is uh, less than 1%, right? I mean, right. wind and solar rather than, for instance, uh, hydro. But because, because hydro is approximately like 18%, and we also have nuclear, which is already kind of 18%. So if you talk about the renewable energy or non-carbon intensive uh, energy, then uh, Russia has approximately 
35 to 40 percent of that type of energy. So the general take by the government is that it's enough for time being, right? So there was not any intention, by the way, uh, at the governmental level to um, hurry up with the creating the new uh, industry and the new sector, which is called renewable energy. Anyway, but this is something that we probably need to talk a little bit more, but uh, and, and deep dive deep also to learn more. So let's switch to some other presentations. Otherwise we will be wasting time. Sp sp thank you very much for your courage and for your time spent on that. So uh, who else, who is next? Our team can be the next one. I will demonstrate my screen. One second. Yes, please. You're very welcome. Can you see the presentation? Uh, yes. Yes. So um, we are the students of the third grade of the <clears throat> international relationship. Uh, Daria Pashkova, Ksenia Konova, and Alina Shevchenko. And today we would like to present our view on climate change, change as a trigger and accelerator of survival decision making in agribusiness and tourism. So, with climate change becoming a pressing issue today, there is a dire need for sustainable solutions. Certain ventures are trying to um, fill these gaps to create a cleaner future with climate friendly technologies. They are becoming more and more relevant in Russia because. Um, both climate change, uh, the whole economic situation or gradual separation from joint ventures within 17 aims of sustainable development motivates us to seek for new solutions on how to develop tourism, agribusiness and medical science and so on in Russia. So our team, with the help of National Agency Association of Investment Agencies and Development, wants to present you today two ideas for startups in Russia, which were specifically designed to suit climate change and not to pollute the atmosphere. So these startups are vertical trusses and glamping. And we will start with the first idea and now I give the floor to the next speaker. Uh, can you hear us? Let's check the microphone. Yes. All right. Uh, so we will start with, uh, with the vertical trusses or vertical farming. Let us clarify what it is actually about. So vertical trust is a practice of growing crops in vertically stacked layers within the boundaries of buildings, cities, and module structures. The essential difference between traditional greenhouse uh, farms and vertical farms is the approach to use territory. Uh, and here we proceed uh, and we would like to outline all the benefits of this vertical farming. The first one is the possibility of local production within the city limits, for instance. The second one is the ability to locate or relocate unused buildings. The third one is lower water consumption. The fourth, it is guaranteed that the harvest will be during the whole year and regardless of weather conditions. Then the possibility of complete energy changing. So we can use uh, solar and wind energy as well. And one of the essential and really crucial uh, benefits is that uh, there is a flexible design and ability to install additional modules to increase volume uh, production volumes. The target audience of these vertical trusses is basically city residents. The sales um, channels are supermarkets, markets, etc. Summarizing this idea, we would like to outline that uh, the demand for greens is increasing by 10% each year. Uh, and we consider this idea to be a really helping hand for cities to grow eco-friendly and healthy food, as well as that it is a wonderful chance to reduce pollution and consumption of really required resources in the world. And now we give the floor to my colleague and we proceed with glamping. Um, let me continue uh, about glamping, talking about glamping. Uh, glamping is actually a combination of two words, uh, glamping and camping, glamour and camping. Uh, it is a sustainable and eco-friendly form of travel. Uh, it's a kind of camping that combines uh, the comfort of hotel room and uh, the possibility of outdoor recreation. 
Um, all these glamping sites that you can see on the screen uh, is primarily made of um, natural materials uh, and sustainable materials, uh, which uh, contributes to its eco-friendliness. For instance, uh, most European glamping sites have uh, even solar showers. Uh, a very low carbon footprint uh, is associated with uh, these types of accommodation. Uh, it demonstrates that uh, developing healthy, environmentally friendly and um, uh, sustainable travel is actually possible. Um, and international uh, networks of people, organizations and tourism industry educate travelers and professionals uh, uh, about ecological concerns to make this kind of travel possible. However, uh, in Russia, such type of tourism is not really widespread. widespread. So therefore, we consider that uh, this is our future and such type of accommodation could be developed in our country. And now I give the floor to my colleague. So now we move on to conclusion. In the modern world, problems caused by environmental change rise faster and more rapidly and become more and more serious. So human activity is the cause of extreme weather changes on the planet, to which it is necessary to adopt. We must not only understand the seriousness of the problem of climate change, but also do something to prevent further deterioration of the situation. Earlier, we proposed two ideas uh, on adaptation to climate change and not aggravating it. So we would like to note the benefits of these projects in a nutshell. Vertical farms or vertical process will allow you to grow plants in cities, increasing yields and reducing the water consumption. Also, fresh vegetables and fruits will be available regardless of the season. This is a great plus. As for glamping, it allows people to get closer to nature and leads to the realization that everything around us can disappear through human fault. Therefore, it raises awareness of the importance of protecting the nature of our planet. And in addition, when building housing for glamping, the principle of an eco-friendly, careful attitude to nature is taken into account, and this applies to both materials for exterior and interior decoration, as well as the selection of household items and so on. In conclusion, we would like to quote the words of Leo Tolstoy. In an immoral society, all inventions that increase the power of man over nature are not only not good, but an undoubted and obvious evil. And in order not to be this evil, we must give what we take, as they say, a small step for a person is a huge step for humanity. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you very much. Um, any questions from the audience? Basically, I have one. Uh, uh, so I I have a question. All right. Uh, 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 what are the examples of, of uh, such uh, tourism? Uh, because I found it uh, an interesting concept, and I'd like to hear about some exa examples of it. I mean, in Russia. Uh, yes, for example, or abroad, I I uh, just want to hear some examples, maybe of some tourist agencies which allow for such a way of uh, having uh, to have a vacation. Right. I guess the ladies are, you know, would like to start that kind of business, aren't you? Probably one day. <laughs> So if somebody give you money, you, know, you would be probably in, in favor of developing such kind of business, right? And there is some investors. Try to get some investors interested. <laughs> in <the laughs> angels, okay, right? Camping or vertical farming. Uh, anyway, okay. So the, the question was, uh, are there any, uh, any practical examples, actually, and phone numbers, actually, to call and to try to get involved? So uh, actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're welcome, Dash. So, as for Russia, I can say that um, <clears throat> actually, glamping in Russia is on the uh, stage of investments, and they're just trying to find investors to start uh, 
um, building this glamping uh, tourism in Russia. So the initial investments uh, are about 5 million. National agency um, of investment has counted uh, last year. But nowadays, as you can see, due to the economic situation in Russia, there are no um, some investors from Europe who had already uh, experience in this sphere. They don't want uh, to build something like that in Russia. But uh, in Europe, there are actually uh, tourism attractions such as uh, Glamping Hub uh, in Portugal, uh, in France, uh, and uh, in U and uh, in Spain, as I know. And um, most often, it is somewhere in the forest near the lakes. It is very difficult to give you just one or two companies which provide this. Um, Tourism, because uh, in Europe it is very well developed, and I would say that there are about thousands, really thousands, glamping tourism attractions in Europe. All right, you can just Google it. And just, uh, and um, if also, we were to, uh, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, I can give uh, clear examples if you can hear me properly. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Please react. Go ahead. All right. Uh, so. If you want to try such kind of uh, tourism, uh, you can Google uh, on the website on Yandex or uh, Google. Uh, there are glampings in Moscow region. So you can Google, choose uh, whichever one you want and go there. Uh, they are really good. Uh, they are uh, trying to implement as more um, eco-friendly ways as possible. So that's a really unique opportunity to try if you really want to. Right. Thank I'll make you. sure to. I'll make sure to look up, look them up. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. And um, basically, there are some nice um, kind of glamping time facilities in South Africa, like very nice game resorts. So I most encourage you to try these opportunities if you have chances and uh, enough money, basically, to fly down there. Um, Shall we go further in this case? Thank you very much. Anybody else to join us with presentations? I guess in, in my list, we still have at least some of them. No? No more? Hello. Yeah. There were there were several requests for, you know, you you placed your Presentation. Yeah, we can continue. Just a second, I will share the screen. Are you going to? Yeah. Deliver your presentation. Okay, so let's start. So please tell me whether you see it. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Great. So uh, the topic of our presentation is the best practice of decision making influenced by climate change. And then we will follow up with ESG financing and uh, how we individually can impact in combating climate change. So we are Elizabeth Minyayeva and Tikhon Kozlov. We are four core students of IBS Renep. So let's move on. Yes, let's start uh, from general statistics to show uh, why uh, our topic is uh, relevant. Um, we can see that uh, in 2022, global greenhouse gas emissions reached a record uh, point of uh, 36.8 billion tons. The increase in emissions uh, was uh, insignificant uh, last year, but the dynamics is still positive. And uh, analysts attribute about... Uh, uh, 60 uh, million tons of additional emissions um, to an increase uh, in demand uh, for heating and cooling due to the weather anomalies and uh, another 55 million tons uh, of the shutdown of a number of nuclear power plants reactors for prevention or repair. Um, <clears throat> All this leads to uh, increased uh, temperatures, increased storms, uh, drought, ocean levels, biodiversity loss, spread of hunger, poverty, and um, health risks for um, society. Um, that is why decision-making in uh, the field of uh, minimizing the impact uh, of climate change risks is a matter of human survival. Let's turn to um, some uh, examples of um, best uh, practices uh, of um, climate-related uh, decision-making. Uh, let's start from biofuels from uh, 
алгаи, а это из это биотопливо из водорослей. If the global economic crisis doesn't prevent it by 2030, 12% of aviation fuel will be produced from uh, LG. Uh, the main problem remains uh, money. Uh, the cost of production will have to be reduced uh, by uh, 90%, but the, this uh, type of fuel is uh, quite uh, environmental friendly. Um, so the next uh, is uh, marine energy. The cost of tidal power plants is still twice the efficiency, but currently uh, developments of uh, are underway to create uh, cheaper and more advanced uh, tidal power plants, according to carbon trust uh, estimates uh, by um, in 2023, marine energy will be able to provide about 20% of the UK's uh, electricity needs. Uh, the next is uh, buildings automation. Uh, for example, the German company uh, uh, N-Ocean uh, is developing a system that responds to temperature changes and the signal sent by the system control uh, the building's uh, automatic equipment, which controls lightning and heating, um, whether the temperature is high or low. Um, the next is a zinc air battery. Um, since the world's uh, zinc reserves are 100 times uh, larger than lithium reserves, the transition to zinc air batteries will be able to make uh, uh, electrical engineering more environmentally friendly and zinc is suitable for processing. Uh, uh, it is relatively cheap and has a large specific uh, energy. Uh, in the coming years, it is expected to launch the production of uh, uh, rechargeable batteries. Um, one more uh, point is uh, smart lightning. Uh, the displacement of uh, uh, incandescent uh, lamps with uh, of fluorescent lamps, uh, which are 80% more efficient, uh, is just the beginning, because uh, smart uh, lightning is an area of uh, innovation uh, in which hundreds or thousands of small enterprises are working, creating new ways to provide uh, poor countries uh, with uh, lightning and uh, developing light sensitive systems, uh, which uh, presents uh, se um, sensors for factories. Uh, next in line, for example, are uh, lamps that provide uh, internet access uh, and uh, uh, detect dangerous uh, chemicals uh, in the factories. Uh, and uh, the last uh, point, uh, the last um, technology uh, is um, a common reuse of raw materials. There is uh, um, one of example uh, of successful reuse. Um, it was shown by a plastic road company from the Netherlands. Instead of uh, asphalt, they use uh, panels made of recycled uh, plastic. Um, it is uh, lightweight. Uh, but strong, um, and uh, these uh, plastic models are um, fastened together uh, and the necessary communications are placed inside them. So the service life of uh, such roads is several uh, decades. At the same time, after the end of use, uh, the material uh, can be uh, again sent for recycling. Okay, yeah, let's move on to uh, investing in ESG. So when we, were, when we were thinking through our presentation, we were asking ourselves, so how do we create uh, this win-win situation, both for general public and businesses? Uh, how do we attract businesses to follow ESG? How do we attract businesses to combat climate change? So um, the question that we were raising is what, how does climate change affect businesses? And uh, we have highlighted that the risk, uh, risks associated with climate change, they have a massive impact on businesses. Uh, like, for example, uh, severe weather events such as floods or droughts, they can damage physical assets such as property and equipment uh, and changes in temperature, rainfalls, uh, natural disasters like hurricanes and typhoons, they can impact agricultural yields, uh, which can eventually lead to an increase in food prices, uh, or maybe an increase in the frequency of wildfires can uh, reduce timber supplies, which uh, impacts profit margins of businesses. 
So here is a question of uh, what does this mean for business? And this simply means that any actions that are taken to reduce climate change can also be viewed as opportunity for further, for further growth. And um, the fight uh, against climate change, uh, it requires uh, a large amount of time, money, of other resources. But businesses can look at this uh, as an opportunity to get ahead by investing in, in sustainable energy sources, by um, increasing recycling efforts, for example, on their part, or even reducing of the environmental impact of their material suppliers. Uh, for example, choosing suppliers that uh, have zero carbon footprint. Uh, and I believe personally that ESG considerations, they should be included in a business long-term um, plans, goal setting, and uh, just overall agenda of business, because it offers not only an opportunity to grow, but an opportunity to, to combat climate change. Uh, and basically, for those who do not know what is ESG investment, investing, it um, is a type of investment that tries to earn a positive uh, environmental, social and governmental impact, as well as a financial return for the investor. Uh, and uh, the goal is to have uh, money generating not only profit, but also positive change in society and uh, in the environment. Uh, and in the context of uh, climate change, it refers to environmentally sustainable practices undertaken by companies in order to mitigate um, all of the negative uh, impacts uh, while still continuing to make profits. Uh, and examples are like using recycled paper for mammoths. This is just a simple uh, way of doing it so that can, business, that can all businesses implement or developing green buildings with features like um, solar panels. Uh, and so the question is how do you personally can find out of the ESG score. So uh, Bloomberg is a well-known site, I believe, that um, has the information of all companies around the world, and uh, it gives a score of uh, each of the factors, for example, environmental factors, social, governmental, and based on this score, you can choose the companies in which you will invest and uh, by supporting which you will personally um, have an impact on fighting uh, with climate change, an impact or just simply reducing greenhouse gases. Um, and in conclusion, I believe uh, and we believe that uh, it's important uh, to follow this ESG investing as it is able to, to slow climate change uh, and uh, this tool that uh, we can, this tool that we can individually use um, to just simply reduce greenhouse gas uh, and uh, make a contribution to overall sustainability. Yeah, that's all. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Any questions to the presenters? Hello. Well, uh, there are some questions and uh, yes, maybe I will leave uh, all of them uh, outside, but I will just raise one quite provocative question. Yes, please. So uh, I would like to thank the uh, presenters for their effort and their job in preparing this uh, these slides. And I would like to ask for their opinion. If we are to, for example, sell cigarettes, tobacco-based cigarettes, on one hand, and invest into uh, cancer medication on the other. Is it an ESG model? It's rather provocative. And, yes, uh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it depends on the point of view, actually. And um, if we're talking on the uh, basic implementation, yeah, it happens in real life. Uh, though still, uh, I believe that the contribution should be bigger than uh, your negative impact. Yes, uh, the, the question is, 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 is far more provocative mm -hmm. because, because uh, you know, there are certain countries that uh, more than 60% rely on tobacco trading and uh, there are certain companies 
that more than 85% rely on incomes from tobacco cigarette selling. Mm -hmm. And there are more than 100,000 of people rely on the job from mm -hmm. uh, producing this, uh, these products. So uh, how ESG is that, basically, the question is. <laughs> you know, you, that's not ESG. <laughs> no, you think it's not okay. I, think I thought that might be ESG. Yeah. Um, maybe because ESG um, combines, uh, well, uh, ecological um, uh, way uh, of um, uh, responsible behavior, um, social way, um, also economical way. So uh, the tobacco companies uh, can... Um, produce uh, cigarettes, yes, uh, but um, uh, as you said, um, they also can uh, um, create uh, job opportunities, uh, they can create uh, infrastructure for, for um, a society, uh, they can uh, start um, some projects uh, to uh, minimize the negative effects of uh, smoking, so um, uh, such companies can be partially in the ECG uh, agenda, but um, yes, <laughs> the question is quite tricky. <laughs> well, basically, I should say that tobacco companies were the ones that were actually very much in favor of ESG. So if you, if you had a chance to look through the um, Philip Morris website, then the, their main uh, task, the main purpose for the business is public health. Isn't it tricky? I guess it is. So basically, if you can justify uh, production of tobacco, then you probably can uh, easily justify the production of drugs in this case, right? I was a smoker for quite some time, right? Probably like 30 years. And I, you know, uh, cut it like 10 years ago, maybe less. But anyway, uh, I know what I'm talking about basically. And um, the, the idea whether it's really ESG type of business if you produce tobacco is really a tricky question. Anyway, I, I really, I'm really glad that you put it on the agenda. Uh, but by the way, it's also uh, about the business which uh, your company is doing, no? I mean, that's why I put that it's, uh, you know, may, maybe after the, the, the session of presentation, we will try to um, summarize what we need to have uh, in our hands and in our heads to be uh, uh, an efficient manager for, for a company that also uh, relies on um half and half or 50 50 esg products so that's why i wanted to uh, see what audience i am dealing with all right okay on a second note they actually do these tobacco producing companies actually it impacts all three uh, they impact uh, the government in influencing their taxes on their products they impact society on because uh, many people smoke and they and they harm the environment because people just throw uh, a lot of uh, garbage just on the streets so technically if we, so, so technically it's esg it's esg in a way that it harms the society and the environment or it, <laughs> in the sense that it actually does favor for it for all of them, actually. Uh, I was I was just trying to... <laughs> Joke, okay. Yes. <laughs> kidding, it's kidding. Okay, cool, I like it. Anyway, uh, do we have anybody uh, else uh, willing to take the floor? Um, yes, we can. Yes, just one minute. Okay. Uh, so, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and let us start by welcoming you all. Our names are Ksenia Klinkova, Irina Talmachova, and uh, Yelena Ilyasova, and we are third-year students of IBS Renepa. And uh, before we start, we'd like to 
thank you all for actually listening to us. And uh, um, now we'd like to talk about the impact of climate change on the beach uh, and coastal tourism and uh, uh, cities and urban center tourism. And first, we'd like to start with beach and coastal tourism. So um, beach and coastal ecosystems, uh, we can say that they are one of the richest, diverse and productive habitats on Earth with a unique transition area between land, ocean and atmosphere. And the coastal area is comprised of forests, savannas and some coastal habitats. And um, with its unique identity, nearly 40% of the human popu population lives uh, within 60 kilometers of the sea and comprise 20% of the Earth's total surface, a significant population area. And um, this makes coastal places very remarkable tourist destination and a major contributor to the economies of many uh, small island uh, nations. Uh, nevertheless, we can see that increasing climate change threats to these places. Um, and uh, there is a very concerning uh, like uh, the threat is very concerning in the form of changing coastal boundaries, uh, sinking islands and seawater intrusion through glacier melting. And glacier melting has contributed to sea level rise. Uh, uh, and it is a very, um, we can see a sea level rise by a um, very marked increase. Uh, this sea level rise is causing changes in short lines and in some coastal areas, as I observed in Kwa Dubai in uh, central Vietnam. And Kwa Dubai, one of the major regions involved in tourism, uh, has observed dramatic short line changes between 1946 and 1980s, as well as over the last 50 years. Um, different climate change processes uh, impact on the individual uh, tourism industry, and uh, as a result, uh, the river mouth uh, shifted toward the south, which can uh, have severe consequences on biodiversity and uh, habitat uh, destruction. Uh, other modeling experiments have been uh, performed to predict future uh, shoreline changes. Uh, in response to climate change by wave activity. A case studied um, from Paradi Port in India uh, suggests that the waves uh, can intensify up to 19% uh, in the future and uh, cause the increased rate of sediment drift and uh, shoreline shift in response to uh, climate change. And uh, similarly, uh, other islands recently gaining popularity for the tourist growth uh, they are Adaman Nicobar Island system of the Union of India. And this region, uh, which extends to Th Thailand, uh, has been known for its rich uh, scenic beauty and a wide range of flora and fauna with its pristine environment. And regional climate change pro uh, projections suggest that the region could uh, experience a maximum and minimum temperature increase resulting in uh, warmer days uh, and uh, and 8% uh, uh, precipitation increase and a long dry season and the annual rise in sea level uh, of uh, one to two millimeters. Uh, now, if we're talking about cities and urban central tourism, um, advancement in technology is a travel through faster transportation, iconic building designs, landmark and modern market designs uh, in the form of malls, provide cities uh, with distinctive tourist destination. Uh, contemporary building designs with planned city style enable them to accommodate and attract a wide range of people. However, these places face climate change impacts in the form of heat waves, also smog, changing beans, uh, beach zones, and seasonal shift. Uh, the building and road material itself uh, makes these processes accelerate faster. The increasing smog problem recently observed in New Delhi, India, is a good example of such a problem in addition to pollution. Uh, most of the urban areas in tropical and also semi-arid zones often experience um, a regional climate phenomena known as the urban heat island. Uh, urban heat island is observed as the uh, metropolitan area having a significantly warmer temperature than its surrounding in rural areas. And in such areas, air trap between the tall buildings and narrow streets can actually heat up. Uh, additionally, 
uh, the concrete land uh, cover infrastructure and also industrial activities add as catalysts to this process. Uh, these effects can be also studied through remote sensing on uh, spatial and temporal scales, and the urban heat island uh, increase with climate change and urbanization also may affect uh, city tourism and their choices of destination. And uh, another impact of climate change in the metropolitan capital city of India is uh, shifting water patterns, which makes it prone to uh, high risk. Um, for fog effects and uh, dengue cases. Uh, the smoke effect caused by aerosols and atmospheric particles by changing uh, temperature is uh, another effect of climate change. Uh, dengue is um, a vector-borne disease with a strong relationship with climate ele elements identified and studied at both uh, the local as well as the global level. And uh, the threatening of metropolitan cities like Mumbai India is another major issue due to the climate change, and uh, it really needs proper planning and management. So um, it is obvious that the future of uh, tourism is directly linked to the climate uh, crisis and uh, our ability to prevent it and to adapt to its negative consequences. So uh, it is necessary to inform companies and the population about uh, the tools to help nature. Uh, we believe that uh, if we will write the popularity of ecotourism, consumers will begin to uh, evaluate travel through the prism of its impacts on the environment. And if we do not emphasize the problem in every sphere of business and leisure, uh, we, will be, we will simply lose our life. So, so that's what, what all that we wanted to say. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Um, any, any questions? To follow up? No, there is one question that we kind of missed. The questions was to Alina, Daria, and Ksenia uh, about the potential disadvantages of vertical uh, farming and glamping. Can you comment a little bit on that? Yes, sure. We have seen this question, so we're ready to yes, answer. Yes, please. Uh, so I'm going to start with vertical farming. Uh, one of the disadvantages is the process of building constructions. As we've said, there are so many layers uh, and it is really time consuming process. The second one is, of course, about uh, investments, money investments, because it requires um, special qualified workers and special technologies to build these farms. But I guess these problems can, can be solved and it's not uh, something tremendously um, hopefully to build up. So I guess um, that will work out. And yeah, so but, what about... Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, just one question to follow. There are uh, at least one, one uh, issue of... It, it, it does require uh, artificial lightning, right? Yes. Which means that some electricity in addition should be produced. Well, if, if you do it, you know, horizontally, in the open land, then it's actually sun, right? But yes. if you vertically in the buildings, inside the building, that you definitely need additional electricity to be produced. So uh, it's all about then sustainable electricity production, probably again using solar and wind, but still there are a need for additional uh, electricity capacities, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now about the also. Uh, also about vertical farming, um, there may be a slight problem of unemployment because uh, all the products come from farmers from located regions, from far located regions. And if this vertical farming uh, farms are going to be installed in cities uh, and these products would be eco-friendly, so there won't be necessity from, well, for the products from local farmers. So there may be a risk of unemployment, but still, I guess uh, this problem can be solved. All right. And uh, I want to talk about glampings. So we couldn't find uh, some great problems, but uh, the only that we think that it's vital is that um, all these campings are located quite far away from the cities. And it's difficult to hire staff because not all people want to uh, go far away every day for work, uh, but 
that, that's like the only thing that we think that can create some problems. So I can um, add something about glamping. Uh, there are two main concerns. Uh, first of all, is safety, because when you build up this camp um, in the forest, uh, you have um, <clears throat> you need to make a decision whether you should chop trees there and uh, should you kill wild animals there, because the residents of the um, of this camp they are likely to meet them and. Uh, Mm, there is no, uh, there is, mm, there is anything which can um, help residents to overcome this difficulty. And uh, the next uh, problem is um, mm, sustainability, some sustainability concerns because uh, those residents who come to this um, mm, <clears throat> glamping camp, so uh, they might use um, some prepackaged food, disposable batteries, and other some single-use items. So, and you should uh, come up with a decision whether you will allow them to use them because there would be a lot of waste and garbage around the camp, or you will just provide them with all the necessities uh, which won't be uh, single-use and they will be multiple-use. So, friendly for nature. Okay, so. good. Are you satisfied, Natalia? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for, uh, I would like to thank you the presenters for their inspirational and insightful presentation. Thank you. And the way you dealt with questions, great. Thank you, thank you very much. So I guess we still have one presentation left, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes, please, go ahead. Can you see? Her? Yes. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Today, my uh, group mate, Yulia Savitska, and uh, I, Olga Tarasa, will uh, tell you about um, um, problems which uh, climate change can cause on demography and agribusinesses. And also, we would like to share with you, uh, in our opinion, um, really brilliant solutions which can help to overcome these problems. Uh, yes, uh, as we know, climate change has become a significant global issue that affects many areas of life, including demography and agribusiness, and many people are forced to make some vital decisions about how to adapt to these changes, where to live, and so on. So let's talk a little bit about demography and um, problems that uh, climate change causes in this area. Uh, the first uh, one of the consequences of climate change is migration. Uh, as temperatures are rising and extreme weather events become more frequent, uh, many people are forced uh, to make decisions and leave uh, their homes uh, in order to search some more safer and stable environments. Uh, the next um, mm -hmm area that is affected by climate change is resource management. Uh, as water and food and other resources become scarce in certain regions, people may have to find uh, difficult choices to, to make uh, difficult choices about how to allocate these resources. Uh, another potential impact of climate change is the increased risk of natural disasters such as floods and wildfires. Uh, these disasters can cause uh, significant damage to infrastructure and communities, uh, forcing people to make uh, some decisions about how to rebuild and where to live. Uh, additionally, climate change uh, can cause public health. Uh, it uh, may affect the spread of some diseases and also some heat-related illnesses such as uh, heat rash or uh, heat exhaustion. Uh, and um, another area uh, that is caused by uh, climate change uh, is uh, that uh, climate change can exacerbate uh, existing social inequalities as many people who uh, live in poverty uh, can face some challenges in um, as they have limited access to some resources and some information that is needed to make some decisions where to live and how to um, use these uh, resources. Next slide, please. And uh, in order to solve some problems, uh, 
it's important to take into account some social, economic, and environmental factors. And um, for instance, the following measures could be suggested. The first measure is supporting sustainable practices. People can reduce their carbon footprint by using some public transport, cycling, or walking instead of driving. Uh, also, they can use renewable energy sources uh, and uh, reduce their waste. Uh, also, uh, another measure is supporting adaptation measures, uh, such as governments can support adaptation measures, such as building infrastructures um, that is uh, resilient to natural disasters uh, and provide uh, some access to clean water and sanitation to the public. Uh, another area is, uh, is supporting reforestation efforts, so people can plant some trees uh, and to be uh, eco-conscious. Um, another measure is encouraging sustainable land use practices, such as conservation and res uh, restoration of natural habitats. Um, and uh, the last one is supporting and protection of vulnerable communities from the impacts uh, of extreme weather events, such as floods, floods and uh, hurricanes. Sorry. So now I would like to come to another area of which um, climate change can affect, and this is agribusinesses. Uh, so Sorry, I have problems with slides. Mm -hmm. So agribusinesses and climate change actually are really closely interconnected because agribusinesses activities uh, such as crop production, livestock uh, rearing and forestry are major contributors to greenhouse gas emissions, which can eventually cause climate change. So, um, I have uh, prepared some uh, points, some problems which uh, climate change can uh, cause and which can affect uh, the nature and the human life. The first one is poor crop yields. So climate change can cause extreme weather conditions uh, such as floods or head waves and eventually it can uh, affect the quality of crop yields. This can uh, result in lower productivity and therefore in higher costs for farmers and uh, it will uh, lead to the decreasing number of profits and uh, reduce the problem of poverty. The next problem is um, water scarcity. So changes in um, precipitation partners and increasing temperatures can lead to a decreasing of uh, the number of water, of the amount of water in our planet and affect the availability of water for irrigation, which is really necessary for agricultural businesses. Uh, this can lead to reduced crop yields and increase the costs for irrigation in future in order to uh, support the same level of um, harvest. The next one is pest and disease outbreaks. So when the temperatures are rising and when the weather partners are changing, um, favorable conditions for pests and diseases can be created. And uh, these uh, harmful elements can uh, damage crops and uh, increase the need uh, for pesticides and other chemical inputs, which can lead to higher costs for farmers because they need to maintain the same level to uh, provide food for everyone. Uh, the next problem is uh, shifts in harvesting uh, schedules. So when temperatures rise, uh, when um, growing seasons um, for some crops may shift, it, uh, becoming, it is becoming more difficult for farmers to plan their planting and uh, harvesting schedules. That is why there can be great delays uh, of uh, harvest um, um, to other to poor countries like Africa. So this is a big problem which can cause um, also poverty and food problems on the whole planet. And the last problem is changes in demand. Uh, 
So when our climate is changing, um, some consumer preferences can be affected and their demand for certain types of crops as well. For example, if uh, there is a shift towards uh, more plant-based diets, this could increase demand for certain crops while reducing demand for others. And uh, based on these problems, I have come with some, in my opinion, um, useful solutions which can uh, help to overcome these problems. The first one is adaptation measures. So farmers can adapt to changing weather partners and extreme events by planting uh, drought resistant crops using irrigation systems, uh, new irrigation systems, uh, which can reduce the number of used water and uh, practicing uh, conservation agriculture. Uh, the next type of measure is mitigation. So agriculture can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, gas emissions by adopting sustainable practices such as reducing tillage, using organic um, fertilizers and using renewable energy sources instead of, um, instead of traditional ones. Um, next measure is risk management. So agribusiness can manage risk, uh, which is associated with climate change by diversifying their crops, investing in climate resilient technologies, which are really popular nowadays, and infrastructure. And of course, it will be better to use insurance schemes because they will help to not to lose the crops in one day and become with uh, nothing and stay with nothing. Um, the next uh, uh, solution is collaboration. So agribusinesses can collaborate with other stakeholders such as governments, NGOs, companies and research institutions in order to develop and implement climate smart solutions. And the last potential solution, which I can suggest, is connected with educational and awareness. So uh, agribusinesses can educate farmers and their stakeholders about the impact uh, of climate change on our planet and on uh, agriculture as well. And they need to adopt sustainable practices in order to uh, per persuade them to do it. So therefore, addressing all this climate change is really crucial for the sustainability of agribusinesses and the global food system. That is why this topic should be debatable on and also should be highlighted by uh, all people in the world. So that's it. Thank you for your attention very much. Thank you very much. I get we've done with the uh, list, right? So. Yes. Nobody, nobody is left, right? So we have we have run through all the presentations. I really would like to thank you very much for your efforts. It took us a little bit more than I anticipated, more than an hour. But anyway, it was good to listen to you all, and then probably to make to make some notes. So the first note I would like to start with is, um, so uh, we talked a little bit. Uh, about the uh, um, low carbon or climate friendly technologies, right? Uh, so this is probably the first uh, the first thing we should do is to reduce our impact on on climate by reducing or basically by diminishing and uh, you know phasing out our uh, greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. So. We talked a little bit about uh, which technologies can be deployed for that, but I would probably start with saying that to, first of all, what we should do is to uh, measure, okay? So there was uh, a number in the presentation that last year, the CO2 emissions into the atmosphere were like recordly high, like 36 and something billion tons. And this is only CO2. We also should actually remember that we are emitting methane, that we are emitting uh, nitrous oxide, and we are emitting a lot of other stuff. So altogether, if you, we calculate in the CO2 equivalent, then basically our emissions are something like 55 billion tons, right, per year. 
And probably, uh, you know, probably that half of the CO2 emissions are then um, uh, Uh, conquered by by the buyer uh, um, by the e ecosystems. I mean the ocean and and land, but half of the CO two emissions uh, re uh, still remain in the, in the atmosphere, thus increasing the uh, the concentration and thus increasing the temperature, the amount of heat coming back from the atmosphere to the earth. So what we should do first is to introduce the system for proper calculating and reporting of greenhouse gas emissions. As you probably know, this year is the first year that Russian business would start doing that on the obligatory basis, right? So this is probably the first, the first thing to do and to learn. How many of you are aware how to calculate emissions? Nobody? <laughs> I don't mean you. <laughs> I mean, I mean the uh, the rest of the audience. Why you taught the way to calculate emissions during Not really educational course? No. Not Actually, really. Not really. Not really. So basically, it's it's probably the first lesson to learn. So if we really are uh, about to tackle climate change, then we first of all need to tackle our impact on climate change and to measure it and to record it properly. And so far, uh, we, most of the students are, are, you know, left untaught, so to say, right? So when you join companies, when you join businesses or consultancies, then you have first of all to start, you know, learning how to do that properly. And there's a lot of, a lot of you know, um, very tricky things to pay attention to. Okay, so the next uh, the next topic that we were probably touching this during the course of the presentation was the risks and the consequences of climate change and their impact on agribusiness, on, on humanity at large, on different other businesses, right? So we are talking about climate change risks, right? And basically, uh, this year, in some countries, including uh, European countries, uh, reporting on climate change is becoming again obligatory to business, at least to big business. You know, how many of you were studied climate risks at the university? No one? Do you know what kind uh, of risks? We have, yes? we have, actually, we have actually studied uh, risks, climate risks, and... Uh, uh, during our course of corporate social responsibility, we passed the test on the site uh, WWF. Uh, this test showed uh, what is uh, everyone's carbon footprint. So uh, everyone knows uh, uh, who's, uh, who has what kind of carbon footprint. Carbon so footprint. You, know. you, mean, you mean personal carbon footprint? Yes. We yes. So we had calculator. Forget about it. It's a false concept. Personally, okay. you don't have carbon footprint. It's producers that have carbon footprint, not you. Because uh, if no, you, uh, okay. it's it's a false concept. Sure. If if you not talk, if you need to talk a little bit more about that, then we can do it. But not during this session. It's a completely false concept because the way to reduce your your footprint is actually to downshift. Is it the way you would like to live your life? Is you actually would like to live your life, meaning that you have like a, a, a you know, a general um, responsibility for the rest of the community? Not at all. It's not your fault, right? That's why it's a false concept. So be, be uh, careful while dealing with stuff like personal footprint. You can talk about the, the footprint of the company. You can talk about the footprint of the product, but not about the footprint of your of your consumption. It's a very, very uh, you know dangerous way of thinking. And actually, it it, it yeah for sure. So be careful. Now talking about risks, do you do you have any idea what kind of climate change related risks should be somehow um, studied or learned or whatever reported about? During the during the, for uh, uh, at, at this uh, climate change reporting uh, requirements, I guess no, or maybe yes. I agree for sure. He knows. 
<laughs> but not from the university. Uh, what about you guys? What do you think, what do you know about the so-called transition risks or physical climate change risks? You can learn a little bit about the physical climate change risk if you if you download our brochure from the, which is uh, now uh, at, uh, at our website, which is called the assessment of physical climate change risks for the companies. There are kind of uh, hints or some introductions to this point. So probably you would be interested to, to know a little bit more about that. But uh, this is kind of must, must have knowledge by the way, about, about what, what climate change risks are all about, how to measure them and how to tackle them, right? Now, again, we talked a little bit in terms of uh, adaptation. So we need to adapt to, uh, you know, changing weather conditions. We have to adapt our uh, agriculture, we have to adapt our tourism, we have to adapt our different other businesses. Uh, there are a lot of methodological um, uh books about the way how we should do it. We also have like the, the prescribed methodologies adopted by the Russian Minister of Economic Development, how mm -hmm. to how to um, measure climate risk and how to how to come up with the adaptation plans. Again, I'm, I'm kind of anticipate that in the course of the uh, education, you will not talk about that. So what I would like to say is that there's a lot of uh, additional knowledge and skills you have to get and develop in order to be successful in this new climate, in this new actually uh, environment where the climate is changing rapidly and we have to deal with the climate change again quickly, right? So I would probably encourage you to spend some time uh, you know, uh, looking around and trying to find out what kind of additional knowledge and skills you would definitely need to have in order to be successful. And I would probably like to ask Grigori to elaborate a little bit on that because he is involved in real practical climate change activity in his company. So probably he would, may, he might kind of, uh, you know, say a few words about that. Can you? Yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, for this invitation. And uh, so, uh, basically, what happened to me was uh, when I was a little something like you, I uh, at the university, which is which is a Moscow State Linguistic University, named after Maurice Torres in uh, the, for the former name of uh, this uh, educational facility, was that the idea that I came up with uh, is, is a case study for my diploma, which I picked up uh, during the fourth year of my training. So I, uh, from, from what I, I see, there are some uh, freshmen in our audience and uh, sophomores, and uh, I see some experienced students. So when I was about to uh, finalize my fourth out of five years of training uh, uh, in the university, I decided that I want to add to my strategic management planning some climate aspects to deal with and highlight them in my paperwork and uh, well, some might call it a faith or a destiny, but but uh, as you might know, Michael is is one of the best, maybe if not the best expert in, in the Russian Federation that has got plenty of information about how uh, how it all started out abroad and evolved into what we have got at the international level under the UNFCCC under the ESG, con uh, ESG concept and ESG management and so on and so forth. And uh, with the help of Michael, I, I managed to find a, a very nice case study to show how a strategy of a company, a strategy of a company can, uh, ev can accommodate the uh, issues of climate change 
And here you must understand why it is so important. So uh, I believe many of you know a lot of examples of companies that are more than 50 years old, 70 years old, 100 years old. And uh, for the climate change, a period of 50 years of observation is the critical minimum which is needed to uh, assess the scale of impact on the company's future. And that's the strategic planning. You can have a short-term strategy, which is up to three years. You can have a mid-term strategy, which is up to five years. And you can have a long-term strategy, which is 10 and more years of running. And this is why, this is why, you will be, if you haven't already been asked a question, how you see your future in five years time, in 10 years time, in 20 years time. So this is for the company that you are trying to get employed by is an answer, is a to find a role for you in the facility, in the strategy that's been planned uh, annually. So climate change is uh, 50 years of observation. We have got the facts that, that, that already result uh, in some changes in companies' behaviors. Some companies had to uh, develop a new product. Some companies had to uh, improve their current product. Some companies had to uh, evolve into something different and uh, and change the business area for for the rest of their lives, keeping the name. For uh, for the company that I found as as my case study, they had to first thing they had to adapt to things that uh, that were already impacting their business as a result of uh, climate change and the result of uh, river pattern behavior annually, because the company uh, is a timber plant and is a pulp and paper mill that relied on uh, the river's scale, the river and water flow rate largely. And so that water flow changed in time so uh, tremendously that the company had to rapidly adapt and plan a new future for, for the supplies for both upstream, which is the production uh, hand, and the downstream, which is the marketing. So uh, my diploma paper uh, uh, highlighted just 80 pages of calculating the carbon footprint that's the impact of the company on the climate. And a very calculation of what the climate change can be for the company in 10 years time. Unfortunately, these data are already obsolescent because I finished my, I graduated in 2008 and the 10 year period already passed in 2018. But the company still exists and evolving and progressing in ESG concept. And, uh, and I'm glad to say that in, 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 I, I, I was curious whether I, uh, whether I was right uh, and whether my conclusions would be adequate in 2018. So I asked uh, the representatives of the company. And even though they, uh, they already changed a lot of the human resources and a lot of people came in and came out, some, some people retired and some people uh, had to, you know, uh, be the, the new shift for the mill. Um, more than 50% of my conclusions of that diploma paper came adequate for the company in 2018 in terms of uh, strategic planning in, uh, incorporating the, the climate change aspect. Aspect number one was, of course, the GHG emission uh, calculating. And this is the stage when the company learns a lot about itself, even it's, uh, especially if it's not just one mill, if it's a, if it's a div diverse company like, like Luke Oil, 
It's more than 50 companies in, in Russia and abroad and more than 20 joint companies with our joint partners all over the world. And uh, when you start analyzing your, your, your GAG emissions, that's the, that, that's the stage of, of inventory, of, of calculation. You may learn a lot of new things, even though you are uh, almighty in the company and even though you spend more than 30 years in that company uh, ruling, managing and progressing it, even though the capitalization of the company has been growing over the years, you may find new resources and opportunities of further, of further growth for the next 25, 20 years. And that's why the strategic planning comes critical. My beginning was, uh, as, a, as a GAG or carbon manager was, uh, was not a lucky one. In, in, in 2008, it was, um, it was not very easy, so to say, to find a good job. As you all remember, the, uh, maybe some of you remember that crisis of, of 2008. And there were many experts that compared that crisis with 1998. So uh, by the time I was, to, uh, I was about to graduate, the crisis was, was on the top. And, I've, uh, and the only thing that I, would, that I managed to find was, was a job for the French embassy. And they asked me uh, as a trainee, to analyze the scheme of joint investment projects under the Kyoto Protocol. The aim of the projects was to find at least two uh, interested stakeholders, one of which would uh, implement the project of decarbonization, that means to decrease the emissions, and the other would buy the results, the effect, and thus adding the investment to the to the low carbon uh, in, uh, development of, uh, of the former. So those schemes were at the first stage of, uh, of preparation in, in, in Russia. And my task was the analysis for the, for the, uh, for the uh, embassies, uh, for, for the embassies knowledge and expertise. But then in 2009, uh, the, in, in, in spring, uh, I found myself in the, in the head research facility of Gazprom. And I found that Gazprom itself was very much concerned about its 15-year uh, future, understanding that this issue will not go anywhere. It will remain and evolve, and it would evolve without the company, which is very bad for the company because you will remain outsider of the process. And if you want to be in control and any effective manager needs to be in control of the situation, they needed the knowledge that they were lacking at that time. So I found myself as part of the laboratory that was specifically designed to uh, tackle all environmental issues, including the greenhouse gas emissions, which is, was quite um, peculiar. Mm -hmm. it, it, you have to understand that in the Russian uh, tradition of ecology, we do not talk about greenhouse gases at all because they are not pollutants. Mostly we deal with pollutants. Uh, and CO2 and uh, uh, N2O, they are not pollutants. So we were tasked to build a concept of uh, GAG emission management, the concept. And for that, we had to go through all the exercises needed to be an expert in GAG emission management. First, we uh, implemented the inventory. We answered the question of how much and how many tons of greenhouse gases we have, we, we produce annually. Number two, we uh, looked for more opportunities of decreasing it without losing part of the profit. Number three, 
we compared our approaches, both inventory and reduction, with what was happening at the international level. And it appeared that we were thinking in the same direction. Like all the people, we're actually going through the same aim, but with different paths. But in here, we found that convergence of the international approach and approach designed by our facility. As the time went on, we, uh, we, we had to uh, deal with other tasks of GAG emissions management. We had to recalculate, we had to improve the methodology, we had to explain this methodology to more than uh 10,000 people at the Gazprom facilities all over the world we found it very difficult to uh make a convergence between the approach uh at, at very details at the source of emissions so um, more than a million sources of all uh, uh, and each needs to be handled and uh, and then uh, once those that pack of uh, problems uh, was solved, I moved on to the UNESCO facility in Moscow to be a consultant to both uh, government and businesses on sustainable energy development. And the sustainable energy development issue already included or had to include the concept of GAG emission management which was a broader uh, problem because there was a gap between understanding uh, uh, on the government side and the majority of businesses that did not see that problem coming in their 10 year strategic planning. So you have to understand that there is, when there is a lack of understanding at the top and the absence of understanding uh, in the bottom, you have to be one a little point trying to explain the necessity of things coming in the short, medium and long term future for the for the businesses and the economy at large to evolve. And that concept, uh, that concept came to hand for the Minister of Energy as it was one, one considered to be uh, um, an agency that was responsible for more than 60 to 70 percent of the GAG emissions problems. And I must uh, compliment to the, to the ministry that they took the responsibility and tried to see what the problem really was. Because the problem of, uh, of carbon intensive energy was the problem of carbon intensive business of the Russian Federation at large. The energy that was produced was required for all the strategic decisions made for the Russian Federation in 2016 to, th to 2018. Those documents are still available on uh, the Ministry of Energy website and, and, and .gov internet. You can see that those concepts were uh, the, the, those were the first efforts of trying to incorporate the GAG emission problems growing as the critical threat and disadvantage for the for the econ economy at large to evolve in the next twenty to thirty years, and that's why. In, uh, and, and that's why our president made the decision to first join and ratify the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement uh, actually was very easy to digest. It did not, uh, it did not ask you to reduce a certain amount of emissions. It did not uh, make you do anything that you will, won't like. It only said that there is a risk of 100 years if we do, if we fail to uh, neutralize and come to zero balance between the emissions, the anthropogenic emissions, and the natural ability to digest these emissions, 
there will be a disaster of over two degrees heating. And, and uh, all the presentations made today prove that the two degree point is very crucial and critical. And that's why we, we can now try to think what a two degree issue actually means in terms of the zero balance. And the amount number one is 56 billion pounds of CO2 equivalent annually that the world economy produces. This is not clear for businesses because this is the world at large. Now, in order to be an effective manager, you have to explain to the company what it means for the company. Does the company participate in this uh, low carbon development or this 30 year low carbon strategy? Does it need to do anything? If the question, if the answer is yes, you need to bring the two degree point to the, to the scale of the company. And the way to do that was to uh, quickly understand the concept of adaptation. And that's why uh, the, the new round of negotiations is now uh, kicked off to, under to better understand the risks that we are actually dealing with. The presentations you made for, uh, for the risks uh, of tourism, for the risks for agriculture businesses, for, uh, for collaboration. I mean that the collaboration between businesses and, uh, and the public sector is vital in, in, this, uh, in this situation. But uh, the things that you, uh, you, you might be curious to know is that it's not the problem of climate change itself. These are problems that get worse with the climate change. If you, if you, if you take a better look at the consequences of these climate changes in, in each of your presentations, you will see that those problems are more than 20 to 30 years old. We had those droughts for years. We had those um, lack of crops and risks for agriculture for years. We just did not know how to handle them. We thought that we could uh, come up with better technological solutions that would raise the productivity. But chasing the productivity, we forgot about risks for the nature that we relied for food, water, and resources to thrive. You may be you may be well trained to uh, to say that businesses are only aimed at profit milking, which is a very good concept and we're very very good way of thinking. But today you just need to add sustainable profit milking. If you uh, if you add if you invest one ruble into into your business and you are guaranteed to receive a billion in five years time. You don't have, you, you can be very happy, but that billion in five years time will be cheaper than uh, one billion today. So you will also be, be asked a question, how sustainable that scheme will be. And if it only, if it only can, if it can last only five years, you should not be very happy because after five years time, it, you will have to make another effort. And after 10 years time, another effort. And the effort you will be thinking to make should be more sustainable than uh, the previous two. And that the concept of adaptation comes in. Uh, the adaptation, the, the incorporation of adaptation or climate change physical risks in cooperation uh, gives you an ability to uh, produce an operative and very quick reaction to changes in nature, in economy, in political system, 
and society at large. That's why it is a um, a very useful tool for that companies use to uh, make uh, a strategy for the better future. Now, uh, it also, if we talk about the Russian business that I'm representing today, we are actually at, at the threshold of very good opportunities. We already know the cost of the living standard that have been proclaimed for years. For example, uh, in, in late 70s and early 80s, the American thought that uh, the living standard they, would, they have is a living standard for life. It is an equivalent that we all need to reach in, uh, by, the, by the end of the 20th century. But as you see, it is quite resource intensive and the planet is not able to uh, recycle and reproduce the, this amount of resources for each and every country and each and every business. And that's why I would like to add to the presentation, to the previous presentation, not just the support of uh, social equality, it's, it also should be social equity. Because in some cases, you don't have to get as much amount of resources for your business as your rival. Sometimes it all, you, you, may, you, you, may, you may need to get less amount of resources and less amount of efforts to reach the same effect. So, so that's three competencies. Sorry, sorry, guys. Add. your mics. Mind your mics. Is it the echo, or 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 or, or, or anybody, or, or does anybody want to add something? But I I would probably ask you to wrap up because we are already over the time limit. Okay. Right. So uh, I I just want to say that uh, from 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 the UNESCO, I, I joined Blue Coil to uh, to bring it all into practice to the company, which was turning it, its face to the ESG investment in the uh, in its own strategy. So the GAG and climate change uh, aspect should uh, become the uh, the part of of the of the corporate strategy. And the best way to do that was to propose to bring up the responsibility for the climate change aspects to the board of directors. And that what, that's what happened when, in 2020 in Lukoil when, when I was employed. That was actually my proposal. Because when you, when you raise it up to the board, you can, there is no way to avoid uh, the, the material tackling and handling of the problem in the bottom. And uh, it, after three years of operating in, in Luke Oil, uh, we have come up with, uh, uh, with the management system. Uh, maybe uh, I believe that the fourth year students in this understand it pretty well that the system means that it is obligatory to each and every employee, even a cleaner. And that brings the necessity of managing it in, in short, medium and long term strategy. And that's why you need to have a goal or a GAG emission aim, which was set up in 2021. And now it's mate as material as the dividends of our, of our equities. You need to uh, you need to ensure that you will uh, you will walk the safest path towards the goal, and you won't be able to do that without your assets, the subsidiaries that work for you. They are not only interested in profits, they're also interested in, in um, sustainable and maintained operations. 
And that's why they're now uh, looking at what the climate change means in their region. I mean, not in the world, not on the continent, but in the region, the Arkhangelsk region, the Ufa region, the, the Kaliningrad region, uh, Krasnodar region. So they, 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 they are looking specifically at what the climate change means to the operation of the equipment that they rely on for their job and their employment. So this systematic view, a holistic view at the, uh, at the climate change aspect is to be incorporated into each and every business today and into your mind to understand that it's a very good tool for you to analyze what it means, what the climate change actually means for, for the society at large, for the businesses and for the prosperity of the economies that you are going to be part of in what? Two, three, maybe four years time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was like good. And uh, I guess the, you, you, there's not much more uh, understanding, or I guess so, I hope so that uh, you have to be really developing your uh, your expertise, your knowledge to be successful in business and to have good uh, job, to help your business, to help your company and to be successful as a manager uh, or whatever as a person in your, in your life project, so to say. So I would like to thank you all very much. If you still have questions to Grigori or to me or to each other, then you are very welcome to put them forward. And then we will be wrapping up. Okay. Any any questions to start with? No. I guess no. Uh, somebody wants to say something. No, yes, I, I, would like, I would like just to thank Grigori for such a good presentation and interesting information. Mm -hmm. Okay. My pleasure. Action. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Mikhail, we would like to ask yeah. you and Grigori to awesome. think a bit after okay. this session is over about who of these young uh, people made the, the, the best. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Sorry for the second. Uh, yes. More, I guess. There's the, the, probably a better effort. And you will probably nominate the you know, the best speakers or the best thinkers of this session. And we'll discuss it later on. I, I'm more, more than willing to provide information about students because dear students, we have practice, uh, we have established an established practice for this uh, conference for five years running now that um, sometimes experts choose some students for a mentoring session, which is, uh, a very promising practice and which help them in may help them in their future career if you are interested also you know follow up the news and you'll probably hear uh, something which refers to you directly thank you very much well, thank you too. anyway i would still like to thank you very much to everybody for their effort and for their uh um, contribution. It, it was. It was. I was. I, I would think it was good to hear you all. I, I also understand that you have a lot of interest in this new climate change related topics, but uh, you still need to develop some some knowledge and skills. I would uh, okay once again say that if you would like to make like an open lectures or whatever, I'm available at any time. If Grigori would like to join me, then we will probably be able to, you know, say something in addition to what we have already said. And um, uh, speaking about the presentation that we've heard, well, they're all nice and well, but they're a little bit too green, I would say. I mean, not too mature. But anyway, there were some, some really nice heights achieved, and I would like to thank you very much again, and you, Irina, first of all for again, making effort to go on with this uh, nice Gaidar kind of forums for the students and for the other interested. See you later. Bye-bye.
Thank you, Michael, for your exceptional tandem with your son. That's the, where the generation theory uh, doesn't have a rest, you know, works at its full scale. Thank you very much. Hi, Grigory, thank you very much. Thank you. Yelena Nikolaevna, Yelena, do you want to say something? Can't, can't hear you, unfortunately. Just, just a sec. Sorry, my fault. Uh, well, I will join those who have already, uh, well, offered their congratulations uh, and thanks. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, this family team that conducted uh, the monitoring, the moderation, uh, the expertise of today's uh, work was great. Thank you very much, Mikhail and uh, Grigori. Hope to see you again in this wonderful tandem. And uh, well, special thanks to all the students who no matter uh, whether it is Saturday or Easter holidays or whatnot, uh, well, uh, um, still, you know, uh, have this drive uh, and uh, wish and will to learn something new, to have their say, to participate, to encourage others. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, I think you have benefited uh, from today's session, just like we all have. Uh, thanks a lot. We will try to organize a couple of after post-conference events. So uh, all the information will be in the Telegram channel. Please follow. Yes, don't switch off. Okay. Stay tuned. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the, inv the invitation. Thank hope you. it was fun and uh, hope to see you all soon. Bye bye. Thank you. So do we. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.